Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Red Olson here at Fort Thompson, South Dakota. We're currently at the Episcopal Cemetery here at Fort Thompson. I'm Wes Peterson. I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I'm a member of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Rochester. My name is Terry Quilt. I'm a Laura Blue Sioux Indian, but I lived in Fort Thompson, this Cook Creek Indian Reservation, all my life. The group from Rochester is here with us today, and they come every summer, you know, once a month uh, during the summer months to help us uh, restore some of the broken down monuments and to take care of the cemetery as it was neglected for years and years. For your information, our, our congregation is quite small and what congregation we do have at Christ Episcopal Church anyway, uh, there aren't many uh, people that actually get out and, want, and, and can do things like this, but uh, we're encouraging more and more people to do that and thanks to some of the people, namely Wes Peterson and uh, I guess the person that really got it started was was Lyle Rustat, if you guys know him. And uh, he's the one that came to me first and asked me who I was, what I was doing, you know, and this was very possible. He asked if this was possible. I said, yes, it is. And who would want to come to Fort Thompson and do something like that? Okay, Terry, if it doesn't work, it's all on you now. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's going to glue this back on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. okay, I think what you're, I think, I think what you're saying, I think they got bent, you know, when it was being pushed over. Yeah, that's all those things. Oh, yeah. The rest yeah. Of yeah. Okay, we can. You're on, you're on, you're on, you're good. Just keep coming down. That was too easy. <laughs> We came out here the first time to, to uh, actually work in the cemeteries four years ago and five years ago we came out to just see what, what uh, the situation was here and uh, a number of folks here walked us through the cemeteries, met with us, uh, well they walked us through the cemeteries twice, once in, in July and another time in February when it was minus 30 wind chill I recall. Um, and then we've been coming out, like I said, for four years, and we've been mowing the cemeteries. Some of the elders, actually, when we first uh, met with them, they wanted us to repair the monuments and reset the monuments. And we thought, well, that's something a small church could do. But then we got here and realized that by the time you get here in June, the grass and the weeds were two feet to, to waist high and you couldn't see the monuments to reset them so so we had to we had to uh, get the places mowed so we could find uh, the monuments But I want to talk about this cemetery here. I said there's a lot of, a lot of old headstones that were neglected over the past years. Nobody knew how to take care of them until uh, the Rochester group came down and started showing us how to uh, restore them. So from that time on, I said that that was our our number one goal. Now is to the upkeep of this cemetery here and the rest of the cemeteries on the reservation. Um, and now for, uh, this is our fourth year, we've uh, been mowing, we're to a point now where we're actually able to 
complete four cemeteries in two days. We did four cemeteries Thursday, Friday, well today Saturday, so two and a half days to do four cemeteries and then we were able to uh, start doing a lot of resetting of monuments, gluing old monuments back in together that are broken into pieces and then leveling monuments and, and footstones. So um, four years later we're doing what the elders asked us to start with. So we're pretty pleased with that progress. We're making progress and we're encouraged to see more and more people now coming out and mowing and uh, coming out here and finding that many large sections of the cemeteries have been mowed so um, that's that's rewarding and I guess one of the most rewarding things about coming out here is um, seeing the pride that people take in in the sites where their loved ones are buried and uh, all of the flowers and some folks are out here trimming and pulling weeds and that's that's very gratifying uh, and we just really enjoy the folks and and uh, really appreciate uh, how hospitable they've been down so far it's uh it's a wonder that we're even here today and uh we've been known for years as a forgotten people but uh because of uh people like uh lyle here in the diversity foundation other uh entities that are not from here you know where uh people are starting to find out who we are where we come from and what we've been through and uh in 1967 roy meyer wrote a book called uh the history of the Santi Sioux, and, and he traced our tribe through uh, the first contact with the white men and how they dealt with us on the land and, and, and everything that they, they did to us and, and tried to help us and then reneged on some of the things and, and it, it showed what, what the Indian policy was to our particular tribe. And, and one thing, there was just a few lines in there about Crow Creek, they said, well, when the women got up here, they were picking the half-digested grain out of the horse manure to make soup. And then it said that many respectable women turned to prostitution to support their families. And I read that and I, and I thought back then, I said, I wonder why they never talked about the Crow Creek. And then I read later, you know, the rape victims don't talk about it. A lot of them don't even want to know it. They won't admit to it. And I thought, here we got, when they finally went down to Santee, there was 900 women here and 143 children and men. So our women really were suffered and humiliated here. And, and I wanted that known because that's why they didn't talk about Crow Creek. And I don't know what you want to call that. Maybe the government would give a spin on that and call it consensual rape. I don't know. They'd come up with something, I'm sure. But that's what happened to our women here. This is one of the spots where, um, where our people were let off the boats at. There's three spots here down this river where our people were let off at, and it just depended on uh, on the sandbars in the river and how high the river was at that time, is where they dropped us off at. They were told to drop us off in the most inhospitable place they could find, and this was it. Um, at that time, there was nothing here. Everything, uh, it was in the, uh, about the seventh, eighth year of a severe drought, and they said that everything was, uh, was dead here, even the vultures were dying. And that winter to follow that, after our arrival here is one of the hardest in South Dakota's history. All of that coupled with uh, the starvation, the, the brutality of the soldiers, the exposure, it, uh, it's a wonder we're even here. Um, the army wouldn't let them out to hunt, to gather food. So you gotta stay right here in this barricade, in this prisoner of war camp. 
And they said, soon there's going to be a barge coming up the river. It's got fresh beef on it and food and tack, you know, whatever they ate back then, but it never came. And uh, my grandmother talked about boiling saddles, boiling their moccasins, their really? leather belts, oh. eating it. You know, and then they ate the bark off the trees down there. They also said that uh, one, one journal entry said uh, on a daily basis, 15 to 20 children were buried that died of starvation, disease, brutality from the soldiers. You know, our people here are, uh, we suffer from something. It's called Ioki Shicha, is what, it, is what we suffer from here. What it is, it's a, it's a deep embedded depression. When our people first got here, I read a lot of journals of uh, the soldiers that were here, the missionaries that come to save us, and you know, all these people that, that accompanied our people, and they all kept journals and stuff. And they all talk about when our people first came here, um, they said uh, that almost every day they are buried about 20 kids that starved to death right here in this area, and they are buried in these hills back here behind us, these bluffs overlooking the river. Our people weren't allowed to leave to hunt and gather what we needed for our family. The army kept saying, you can't leave, you can't leave. You have to stay here, just wait. Uh, um, a uh, boat full of fresh meat is coming. I'll tell you a story. When uh, Months after our people were here and we weren't allowed to leave to hunt and gather and our people were dying left and right every day they were starving to death. My grandma even said that uh, they ate the bark off the trees. They would uh, go down to the river and they would gather mice beans they call them, baby mice. They'd find them nests and they'd throw them in the soup and they always had, they always put a rock in the soup. The boiling water would boil the minerals and stuff out of the rock and that was, you know, that was sustenance. That was what kept a lot of old people alive. But uh, this man, um, he was one of the leaders of this tribe and uh, he kept asking to go hunt, go hunt. They could smell the buffalo up there when the wind was blowing right, the buffalo were north of us about 30, 40 miles and our people could smell that. So they kept asking, kept asking to go, and they said, no, there's a boat coming, the fresh meat, supplies, everything you need on it. Well, months of this went by and nothing ever came. So this, uh, this, head, this, this head man of the tribe, he took three warriors and they snuck out of camp and they tried to catch the buffalo on foot. They left with nothing, no guns, no nothing. And uh, they were gonna try and you know, bring a buffalo back. The buffalo had already started moving north by then and uh, they couldn't catch up so they turned. They could have stayed out there, they, they, they could have left. They could have left all, all this behind, this torture, this starvation. But that wasn't our way. They came back and uh, on their way back somehow they captured or killed four deer and they drug them back down here and snuck, snuck back in through the soldiers. Come down to the river here and they started uh, butchering up the deer and as, I, as you can uh, probably figure you know it caused like a feeding frenzy you know everybody fresh meat everybody just went down to the river where they were butchering these deer up and then four warriors they, they, they didn't take anything off them deer they didn't eat that whole time they left it for the people and they went up the river by themselves and uh, the army saw what was there, there was a commotion down here so they come down see what was going on, they saw these four deer laying there. And uh, they asked who did it. And uh, of course nobody said anything. So first thing they did was they went up and they shot a grandmother in the face. And four warriors that brought them deer and heard them shots, they come running back and said, we were the ones that brought the deer. So the soldiers rounded them up and took them and they imprisoned them in the, in the, uh, in the, the prison. And uh, um, but two days later, a boat did come up the river from the government, but it wasn't loaded with meat. It was loaded with new rifles and ammunition. 
Gatlin guns, cannons, all this stuff. They took them four warriors, they tied them up out in the field there, and they, the whole army sighted in these, their new rifles on them four warriors. They said when it was over, it was just a pile of red stuff over there below the post. Mm. Numerous, numerous stories like that. We suffer from something it's called Ioki Shicha. It's, uh, it's, today it's known as historic trauma. It's clinically diagnosed as the same thing soldiers suffer from when we return from war. You know, we're, a, lot, a lot of us are, are depressed. We don't know what it is. We don't know how to deal with it. We don't know where it comes from. You just get that real lonely, gut-wrenching feeling. And, um, you don't know what to do about it. You do whatever you can to get, to, to get rid of that bad feeling. Said that, uh, we keep passing this on, this, this depressive gene from generation to generation. All the little ones are born with it. They come up that same way. That lonely feeling in their heart, that empty feeling. Nobody there to encourage them, to teach them that way, to teach them who the Creator is. Our elders don't teach that. A lot of them won't because of them Catholic boarding schools. That way it was beaten out of them. I know elders, my mother was one of them. She'd wake up screaming. She was raped and beaten in that school for speaking her tongue by a Catholic priest. A lot of our elders are that same way. A lot of them stayed here. The women they married into, the people that were here already. So they stayed, a lot of people stayed here. And, uh, they always told stories of the soldiers riding into camp and just burning everything, just for the heck of it, you know. We just get set up, get some teepees, get some, you know, some meat hanging on the racks, and here come the soldiers. They pile everything up and burn it. You know, we'd have to start over again. My grandmother talked about a lot of these things, and those come. A lot of them stories come from my great grandfather, Joe St. John. He was eight years old when they hung them 38. And he was standing in the front there. <clears throat> and uh, just before they were hanged, they asked a medicine man to sing a song. So he sung this song for him. And he turned to my, my grandfather and he said, don't let anybody forget this. So his whole life, till he died, every day he got up and he sang that song to somebody. Even if there was nobody around, he'd go out and he'd sing it to the horses. And he would tell this story about what, uh, about what happened to our people. Every day he did that. The song, <coughs> The song that was sung was passed down from generation to generation in my family and now my brother is a keeper of this song and that drum from that day. And he comes down here and he sings it for us. When 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 we do things like this for you know for the kids, for for our people, he'll come and he'll bring that drum and he'll bring that song and he'll sing it for us. That was that song was from that day when thirty eight were hanged. It's up to us that are here now to never forget that, to always tell that story. Never let our people forget what happened to us, what, what we've been through, where we come from. Hopefully things will mend, things will change, and our people will reconnect, you know.
See, this is part of the community now again. You know, people come out here and commune with their relatives, and they, uh, um, it, it's a place that's, I mean, it's strange to say, but I think people enjoy coming here when we meet them out here when they're working on their graves. Um, I think they actually enjoy it. And then the other thing I would say is just that the folks here have been just tremendously hospitable and nice and great folks to work with and uh, um, we just appreciate all they do for us when we come out so it's a uh, um, as much as we do we get back twice uh, in their kindness and in their help and their support so we really appreciate it the fact that I appreciate you people taking time for us to, to do this it, it's just grateful I mean it's it's heartwarming and it's just can't thank you enough for doing something, a project of this size and of this magnitude.